when the sun is high above us or the moon is full aglow what better than to sit by the river and watch it flow for now is the time to write words on sand and drink in the wisdom of far ancient lands for the heavens soar above us while the earth is still below what better place than to sit by the river and watch it flow draupadi looked at that delicious lone fruit which was in that on the jambu tree she plucked it and was about to eat it when the tree spoke hey draupadi that was for the rishi who is doing his penance behind me for the past 12 years he has been doing penance and today is the last day and he is supposed to eat that fruit now you have contaminated it draupadi ran home terrified she brought back bhima and arjuna and requested both of them to fix the fruit back they were helpless they said we can't do this the tree spoke and said a chaste woman can fix it back draupadi immediately said i am chaste Yes I have five husbands but one person for one year The tree asked Don't you have any other person in your mind Of course not said Draupadi Maybe yes Krishna but he is like my friend nothing more The tree said Think again Draupadi looked at the tree and put her head down. Yes. She remembered the day of her swayamvara where she saw this great warrior in shining armor years with shining jewels coming for the swayamvara. Her heart flipped her stomach fluttered but no i can't i shouldn't i am the great beautiful draupadi the daughter of the great drupada how can i marry him if he wins in the swayamvara and when that great warrior came and picked up that bow she said stop you are of lower caste i can't marry you and then she remembered what krishna said when she went running to him piteously what wrong did i do that i had to be humiliated so much in front of all the elders what wrong did i do krishna told her gently didn't you not say no to a great warrior because of his caste wasn't that a wrong he would never have lost you in a game of dice he would have always protected you draupadi lifted her head and she said yes i love karna he would never have lost me in a game of dice he would have always protected me her heart felt light now her secret was out do she knew both bhima and arjuna were shocked and furious but she felt light the tree said now you try fixing the fruit back onto the tree and she fixed it the f- rishi finished his penance ate that fruit and blessed them all this is a story i read 
from the book Jaya by Devdar Patnaik. He says that this is the folk tale or folklore of Maharashtra. And they say that the jambu, jambu fruit, which I know as jamun, when you eat it, you can never hide it. Your tongue will give it away. Thank you for this opportunity. Bye there. This is Parvati Ishwari. Hello everyone. My name is Adhyasha Nandini. And today I'll be narrating a story that I have penned. The title of my short story is Testosterone in a Sari. As the warm breeze whispered through the chimes, hanging from the balcony ceiling, taking her quilt of Lakshmi Galop to the lavatory. Apparelled in an unadorned siphon sari with a thin border, Lakshmi adorned her lips with a dark lip shade and puts vermilion at the parting of her hair. Swipping her hair into a neat bun at the crown of her head, Lakshmi hurried to Gauri's room and putting her long bony fingers on Gauri's forehead, she muffled. Gauri, Uth jau. Gauri, uth jau, vanna school ke liye late jau ki. As she hung back to take her commodious white blanket off, Lakshmi sang Gauri, her favorite lullaby, swaddling her in her arms. Rubbing her eyes and yawning constantly, gaping her mouth, Gauri said, It's so soothing, ma. Don't stop singing, please. Tickling her non-calently under her ears and greening like a Cheshire cat, Lakshmi said, Gauri, jaldi se fresh ho ja, vanna bon vita thanda ho jayega. Okay, ma. I'll be there in ten minutes. As Gauri packed her school bag, looking into her timetable, Lakshmi fed her two large-sized aloo parathas with little extra butter. Gulping the last of her bon vita and passing her tongue over her upper lip, Gauri said, let's go ma or else we will get late. Clasping her hand in Lakshmi's, Gauri walked to school neatly dressed with two ponytails. Dropping her off at school, Lakshmi said, Bye Gauri, man laga ke padhai karna. Wrapping her arms around Lakshmi's waist and beaming as happy as a lark, Gauri said, Bye ma, sham ko milte hain. As Lakshmi's high hills clattered down the road, young lads mocked at her saying, Dekh bhai hijra hai, sham bhaiya dekho dekho kinnar ja rahi hai kinnar. An ocean of laughter surrounded them when they saw her passing by them. The mocks of the young lads perforated her, but without uttering a single word, she traded away with an enduring grin on her face. As she was about to fall upon a plump chick little girl leaking a popsicle, her mother dragged her away from Lakshmi, looking straight into her brown beady eyes with her dark malevolent ones. Lowering her gaze, Lakshmi walked away quietly. On reaching the NGO, she rushed to her cabin and after completing her paperwork, she headed in the direction of the hall where hundreds of orphaned and abundant girl children were taught for free. Seeing Lakshmi at the door of the hall, a young girl stood up and as her eyes said elation, she asked, Lakshmi I, Lakshmi I, kathap kab sikhaoge? Looking into her virtuous dark brown eyes, Lakshmi replied, Gaitri, jitni jaldi ye questions complete karoge, mein aapko kathak sikhaungi. Couple of hours later, Lakshmi was seen guiding her hands, sinking to the music of Sarangi and Manjira. Untying her anklet belts, she said, Aaj ke liye bas itna hai, kal shaam ko milte hai. Beating them goodbye, Lakshmi left for her home. As she waved her hand at a tempo, the tempo driver drove away, Lowering his brows and drawing them together to form a V. Unable to hire a public transport, Lakshmi plodded to her house, weary and exhausted. Striding across the road, Lakshmi came across a gang of boys poking fun at a teenage girl. 
The sudden rush of blood made Lakshmi lash out at the boys breaking the bones. As the boys rolled on the ground in agony, Lakshmi helped the teen to her home. Wailing like a child, the teenager said, Thank you, Tai. Thank you so much. Tucking her locks of hair behind her earlobe, Lakshmi said, You are welcome. Take care of yourself. As the moon rose and the night air smelled honeysuckle, pulsed with the sound of the crickets, plumping herself down on one of the benches in a vibrant street of Mumbai, Lakshmi was taking a trip down her memory lane. Enveloped in a blanket of twinkling stars, she remembered how five years back she had saved Gauri from child trafficking, fighting against the evil and malicious eyes of the child traffickers. Since the day she had rescued Gauri, she had become her Lakshmi Ma, a trans mother. Thank you. This is an incident that happened a long time ago. I went for a sports day at a nursery school. The age group of the children there was three to six. And I saw the excitement and you know that whole sports day feel there and I was also very excited to be part of this whole thing. So there was this Shamiana tent that was placed for the parents and all the parents were sitting there. And because the children were so young, after every round, the children came back to the parents. And the people, the children who had gone on to the next round were sent back. So now when they came back to the parents, the parents were all so excited. They were so excited when the children had won and they had so many questions when the children had not won. And they were given, giving strategies for the children to go on to the next uh, round and all that. Uh, next to me was a family. They didn't seem to be bothered about what was happening around them. That child was really doing well in all the races that she was taking part. And, um, but she came back and then they were talking about a lot of other things, a lot of other children. And you know how excited that one was and how happy they were that this one had done well and a lot of things like that. I was just noticing them. And then it was time for this child to go for her final round in one of the races. Both the parents said, have fun, baby. And that's it. Ruffled her um, hair and sent her. And she just waved and went. The race was going to start and all the children were looking towards their parents and seeing whether their parents were... Uh, cheering for them and all that. This child had found something really interesting on the ground and she was busy picking it or digging it. I don't know what she was doing. The race was called. Everybody started running. And this child, like I told you, was really good. She was way ahead of the rest. She was really running fast. Suddenly she looked back and she slowed down. Just before the finish, she slowed down, allowed the person who was second to finish the race and then she ran and finished. And she was clapping louder than everybody else. She was so excited. Now I was, I found this very strange. I was just watching it and climbing up on the second podium was so exciting for her. And she came back after the race and the parents were so happy, hugged her, kissed her and said, baby, did you have fun doing this and all that. Then after some time, the mother said, did you let that other child win? And the child says, yeah, mama, you told me to have fun, no? That ba uh, baby's mother told her you must win the race. So if she didn't win the race, she would feel sad. And I don't want my friend to be sad. So I thought if she's first and I'm second, both of us can be happy and both of us can go on that stand together, Mama. And the mother just looked at her and said, it looks like you had fun doing that. And the child said, yeah, Mama, that was so much fun. And 
there ended the conversation. They started talking about something else. This incident has been fresh in my memory after all these years. I often think about it. I often revisit this scene. And I think a lot about it. What do you think about what happened? Hi, it was the summer of 1996 and I was very excited about taking my first solo trip to Turkey. I was going to go there for a conference and also spend a few days traveling around in Istanbul. I was going to go to Istanbul because a friend of mine who also was an academic like me and had completed her PhD from Canada, had returned back to Turkey to work just like I had gone back to India to work. Uh, she was partly hosting this international conference and she was keen that I would come and I was excited to go because it was, you know, it would just give me time to explore Istanbul, a country that I'd never been. Until this time, I had already traveled to the US, to Canada. I'd actually lived there for five and a half years. I had spent almost two weeks in Switzerland and I had been in London, but I'd always been with family or friends and I'd always been in places where people spoke, pretty much everybody spoke English. Uh, Turkey was the first place that I was going to go alone. I had, it was a short trip uh, and much later I realized that actually nobody or almost hardly anyone spoke English. By way of preparation, I had done very little. My friend had booked for me a room in a, in a university guest house. As an academic from India, Having a cheap accommodation was like the first step to preparation. And um, the uh, hostel, she said, was going to be practically vacant because it was summer holidays. And she would then be there to take care of me and, and show me around. So um, I knew I would have somebody. So I photocopied a few pages from the Lonely Planet Guide on Istanbul. And a number of people who I had mentioned to that I was going to Istanbul said, oh, you must go to the Blue Mosque and you must roam around in the central market, in the central bazaar of Turkey, of Istanbul. At the uh, bank, I had exchanged money and I was surprised to see some some notes which read millions and lakhs and something like that. And I just could not at all understand that money or relate to it so I put it in an envelope and put it tucked it in the front of my pocket a few days before I was to go to Turkey I heard from my friend that she was expecting and there were some complications and therefore her hus her doctor had said that she uh, was advised not to step out of the home and she had to take bed rest and um, so she was you know, really apologetic, but that was okay. I was very excited and I was like, I would not, you know, it's fine. I'll take care of myself. Um, of course, she gave me her phone number saying that, you know, if you have any need, please call me uh, and so on and so forth. Anyway, um, reached Istanbul, really excited, got to the hostel, took a cab, got to the hostel, found my room. And next morning, I was ready to go explore the city. I uh, found out, took a bus, went to uh, the Blue Mosque, walked around it, spent about a one and a half hour there, just awed by the mosque as well as the, uh, the outside of the place, saw the old aqueduct and walked to the bazaar. Uh, as I walked to the bazaar and as I entered the bazaar, it was a riot of colors and smells and and people all around it was just fascinating 
the blue eyes with the dark blue circle inside um, hanging all around carpets and and spices and and sh small shops where people were eating and talking and so on so spent hours just absorbing uh, the sights and the sounds and the beauty uh, and the uh, hustle and bustle i remember um, i walked up to a carpet fellow i was looking at the carpets of course they were far too expensive for me to buy but they were just so beautiful silk carpets uh, with some 30 knots or 100 knots per uh, you know square inch um, so i'm looking at them and admiring them and one of the carpet uh, fellow said so where are you from and of course this was not in english you know we're talking uh in in the shopkeeper language uh, shopkeeper customer tourist language and and i said india and and he said oh india oh gandhi and hema malini beautiful women walk, dancing around the trees uh, and gandhi peace um these were two associations that uh, i had never put together for india of course gandhi was a very common association but hema malini beautiful women dancing around the trees um and and he went on to talk about uh, uh, indian movies and of course all of this in um, me in english and he in turkish um anyway walked around and i reached a a place where there was food and tea being served and i'm a sucker for tea i saw all of these people drinking in uh, beautiful glass uh, small glass tumblers with a golden edge uh, something that looked like tea there was also some people calling out chai 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 and i i looked around and i couldn't see anything anything chai i couldn't read the menus in fact the only um, uh, thing i could see was something that said cay and i didn't know that it was chai uh, but i really wanted chai at that point of time and i saw these two men sitting at a small shop having um, chai i walked up to them i pointed out to what they were drinking and i asked them where do i get it um they asked they pointed back to me they showed me where i could get it and and they encouraged me in a non verbal way to go and get the chai so i walked up to the counter i was fumbling with the the envelope where the money was and and the person at the counter said no 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 payment uh, those people already paid and of course all of this is being said non verbally i figured that they had already paid i got my cup of chai and i went and sat and um, had chai with them and as i had chai um, you know we exchanged smiles there was a lot of excitement we can't speak there were lots of people who stopped by and and they would have a conversation with these two men and i would uh, and they would smile at me and i would smile back at them and it was just a very very beautiful moment and and at some point they they uh, asked me where i was and i uh, told them conference i told them koch university the hostel that i was staying in and and all of that so i tried communicating with me they tried communicating with me um and it must have been a half an hour of pure joy pure um connection as people um uh, you know meeting each other from different lands different language and then suddenly i started to feel afraid what if these men are just finding out information uh, so that they can follow me what if is it really safe for me to be sitting here and drinking tea and there were all these voices inside that were saying are you being so, how can you be so stupid how can you be just sitting here and having chai telling strangers accepting something from them for no reason and once that started to dawn on me i quickly packed my bag and i quickly left them i said thank you and i literally ran out of the market and reached took the bus and reached my hostel it was almost 5 by the time i reached my hostel and as i sat back and i felt really sad i felt really sad for the fact that that human moment of connection had been severed because of what 
I had heard and I had internalized as what was safe and what was not safe. And the fact that a woman traveling alone or a woman alone has to worry about her safety. Many years later, I still go to many places that I have no clue about. I still meet people who have no clue about where they are and what they're doing. We always connect, we always laugh, we always smile, we always do. And very often I see that fear of meeting strangers, of talking to strangers, of asking help from strangers. It always saddens my heart. I really learned that day that it was so important to, while being safe, to also savor the human connection, which is much beyond language, which is much beyond gender, which is much beyond money. It's just the connection, the purity of connection. I really, every time I'm able to establish it, irrespective of age, connection, I have something that gets freed in me. Thank you. This is Meera Venkatesan, a storyteller from Bangalore. And today I'm going to share with you the story of Bhartrahari, the great king from India. Well, I am sure you would, sh you would have heard about his brother, the king Vikramaditya. Yes, Vikramaditya of the Vikram and Vedal fame. Now, Bhartrahari was Vikramaditya's elder brother. In fact, he became the king after his father, Samudragupta's death. He was a very just king. He was a good king. He was also a very accomplished poet. But above all this, he had another claim to fame, which was the fact that he was an insatiable lover. He had hundred wives. And there was nothing he wanted more in his life than to enjoy their pleasure, enjoy their company forever. In fact, he was the author of a very beautiful set of hundred verses called Shringara Shataka, the hundred verses of romance and love. Now, the story would not have taken off from there if that Brahmin had visit, visited the kingdom. One day, the Brahmin just walked into the king's court and he had in his hand the most beautiful, luscious, red, flaming pomegranate fruit. The Brahmin said, O oh king, I obtained this from the great goddess Kali. But of what use is it to me, a Brahmin who has dedicated my life to learning? This whoever eats this fruit will be blessed with youth and vitality forever. Oh, said the king, that sounds interesting. And the Brahmin handed over the fruit to the king. Now the moment the Brahmin left, who do you think the king thought of? Yes, his wife, in fact, his most favorite wife, Anangasena. What more would he want in life than for her to be young and beautiful forever so that he could enjoy her company? So he quickly went to her chambers and handed over the luscious fruit to his ravishing queen and told her, O oh queen, do have this fruit. Then this will ensure that you will never lose your youth and beauty. The queen was quite happy and thrilled that she got this fruit and she assured him, I will surely eat it, O oh queen, O oh king. Now some time passed and the story would have stopped there too. But it didn't because one day a courtesan came to the king's court and insisted that she see the king. A 
But because she insisted, she was let in. But the moment the king set eyes on her, he was shocked. For in her hands was the same beautiful, luscious pomegranate. How did it come to her? You must have stolen it, he told her. The courtesan said, O king, is this the way you respect us in this kingdom? I came here to gift it to you. This was given to me by my lover who wanted me to be young forever and beautiful. But I thought, of what use is it that I be young and beautiful? It is the king of the country who has the right to have this fruit. So I ran from my house as fast as I could so that I could give it to you. Well, said the king, who is your lover? Of course, your charioteer. Don't you know him? I am in love with him. Oh, said the king, and the charioteer was summoned. How did you get the fruit? He was questioned. The charioteer, after a lot of questioning and effort, admitted that he got the fruit from Anangasena, the king's favorite queen. The king boiled in anger. This could not happen. Well, everyone would have been beheaded, but at that time the king decided that all this was a maya, an illusion, and he decided to give up everything. He set forth into the forest, giving away his kingdom to his brother, Vikramaditya. And after that, he has written the next hundred verses called Vairagya Shataka or the hundred verses of renunciation.